Okay. Welcome to the global seminar of the Global Columbia Collaboratory. I am Shannon Marquez, Dean for Global Engagement at Columbia University. And I'm so honored that you join us today for the first seminar in a four part global seminar series focused on the Amazon we want. We've invited experts to step into the collaboratory critical issues related to land use, climate, and demographic changes in the Amazon and their impacts. And now, before we begin this important discussion, and especially for those of you joining us for the first time today, I want to provide a bit of background about the Global Columbia Collaboratory. The Columbia University Center for Undergraduate Global Engagement, in partnership with Columbia Global Centers and Columbia World Projects, launched the Global Columbia Collaboratory in May 2020 as a virtual exchange initiative to support students around the world. The Collaboratory brings students, thought leaders, and educators together. It promotes cross-cultural communication and enhances skills and global competence to allow students to reflect, ideate, and collaborate to empower them to make a difference in the world. Students have participated from over 36 countries around the world, and they're drawn from all three of our undergraduate schools and colleges at Columbia as well as visiting institutions. Now this summer, we have 48 students from 16 countries representing 10 universities. They're tuning in today from across Asia, Europe, the Americas, including New York, Mumbai, Bogota, Tel Aviv, and Hamburg, just to name a few, using smartphones and laptops to access the collaboratory platform. Students form a community of global thinkers and problem solvers through participation in themed global seminars, such as our seminar today, and facilitated reflection and ideation and collaboration activities. Now, as learnings and perspectives are shared across the collaboratory, students form project teams, and they receive funding to collaborate to tackle specific global issues and topics of interest. And the collaboratory serves as an incubator for bringing ideas into reality and promoting new projects and innovative solutions to global challenges. So we are thrilled that undergraduate students from all over the world have been actively engaged in the collaboratory every semester since it launched in 2020. And the program continues this very summer with the very important focus on the Amazon we want. Now I encourage the global audience to submit questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And again, I wanna thank everyone for joining this seminar. We have some amazing experts who will speak with us today. And I want to thank all our partners and esteemed panelists. We're so pleased to be working directly with Columbia Global Centers for the seminar. This time, I want to introduce Tom Trebek, Director of Columbia Global Centers Rio, who will give some introductory remarks and introduce our moderator today. Tom? Thank you so much, Shannon. And good morning and good afternoon to everyone who joins us online. Um, I'd just like to start out as the moderator, it's a great privilege to just quote from the preamble to the science panel for the Amazon, uh, entitled the Amazon, or the study entitled the Amazon we want. Uh, scientists uh, in the uh, SPA call upon the world to commit to saving the Amazon from the compounding effects and threats of extractive industries, destructive deforestation, forest and riverine degradation, fires, illegal mining and logging, and climate change. This would be a momentous topic for us to study and reflect upon at any time, but it is particularly poignant and momentous today as we await with increasing dread word about Don Phillips and Bruno Pereira who are missing in the Amazon, uh, presumably for their work to call the world's attention to these exact same threats. Uh, so these individuals and their families are much on my mind and our, on our minds as we begin this unique Amazon collaboratory. Uh, as a moderator, it, uh, I will be introducing the panel a little bit later, but uh, we're very privileged to have the SPA convener, the Science Panel for the Amazon convener, uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs uh, of Columbia University. Jeff is university professor uh, at, uh, at Columbia and one of the most influential scientists of his or perhaps any generation uh, on many issues, including sustainable development. Jeff, I know you only have uh, uh, some time in your busy schedule to speak to us, to provide your keynote remarks, but we'd like to turn right away to you for the time you have available. Thank you, Jeff. Welcome. Tom, thank you so much. And thanks to all the students in the collaboratory. What a wonderful adventure 
Uh, and uh, greetings uh, to all colleagues and especially to Carlos Nobre, who uh, has been such a brilliant leader of this science panel for the Amazon, uh, reflecting his scientific leadership on uh, the Amazon for, for many decades, a world renowned uh, and world leading scientist. You know, for me, uh, I'll tell the students, I started uh, my venture in this area 50 years ago, uh, yes, as a first year student at uh, Harvard College in 1972. And what's interesting for, for me about this looking back is that it was the first year that the world's governments got together to reflect on the fact that we had a crisis growing. And that is that the way the world economy works was going to collide with the way that nature works. This was a conference in Stockholm, Sweden, that was the first ever, it was called the UN Conference on the Human Environment. And world leaders had never really thought about how economic development affected the whole planet and major ecosystems like the Amazon. But not only the Amazon, uh, like uh, the uh, other main rainforest regions of the world uh, in the Congo Basin or in the Indonesian archipelago or the whole ocean system, or as we know now much better than in 1972, the climate system. It was also a year in 1972 when the first attempt to model the global economy linked to nature came out as Limits to Growth, a book produced by a group of leading business people called the Club of Rome. And they hired a, uh, a, a team at MIT, Meadows and Meadows, to make a simulation model of the dynamics of the economy and the environment. And it was a very primitive model, one could say, but it was completely a breakthrough 50 years ago to think about this kind of global uh, interaction of the world economy and the world environment. And the conclusion of the model was that if you have compound growth that is resource using in certain ways on a finite planet, you will hit boundaries. We now call them planetary boundaries. Uh, at the time, they were just called resource scarcity. And the model didn't get right exactly which resources would be scarce because it was focused mainly on the scarcity of some metals or some other primary commodities, not so much on biodiversity and climate. But the basic idea was very powerful which is if you drive compound growth on a finite planet, beware, because you will hit limits unless your growth is of a very high quality, unless it is designed to be resource sparing or recycling or circular economy, we now call it, or drawing on vast stores of renewable energy like wind and solar power, which are not infinite in amount, but are thousands of times more than we actually use in uh, power on the planet. So 50 years ago was the start of this. It was the start for me too in thinking about this issue. And I have now watched over 50 years the failure of the world's governments to get a grip on this. 1972, then 1992 was the Rio Earth Summit and three big treaties were adopted on climate change, biodiversity, and desertification. And then those treaties were not implemented. So 20 years after that, in 2012, the governments met again in Rio on the 20th anniversary of the Earth Summit, and they announced that we need sustainable development goals. And I went to work uh, for the Secretary General on helping governments to shape 17 sustainable development goals, which we now have, and the Paris Climate Agreement. And again, the world's governments have made big declarations twice in 2015, once to adopt 
the uh, Agenda 2030, as it's called, the Agenda for Transformation for Sustainable Development, which includes the 17 SDGs. And a few weeks after that, in December 2015, the Paris Agreement. So here we are seven years later. How are we doing? Not well. Uh, not only did many governments, including unfortunately the United States government, basically blow it off, this whole thing. Trump walked out of the Paris Agreement <laughs> entirely. Uh, and neither the Trump administration or the Biden administration has, has had almost anything to do with the SDGs, sad to say. But then, of course, came the pandemic and then uh, the war in Ukraine. So we are a world that is constantly being shaken by these kinds of shocks. And our governments are so much more likely to focus on war than they are on sustainable development. If you roll back the clock 22 years ago, when the Millennium Development Goals were adopted in the year 2000, that was followed the next year by 9-11. And off we went to the global war on terror, one of the stupidest ideas that my country has ever come up with, uh, because they didn't understand that the terrorism is a symptom of many things that you can't fight a global war on terror other than to get yourself enmeshed in lots of trouble. Well, without digressing, we're now 40, we're 50 years from the Stockholm Declaration, 30 years from the Rio Earth Summit. We are uh, 15 years, uh, we're a decade from the uh, Earth Summit plus 20, we're seven years from adopting the Sustainable Development Goals, and it's still not working. So this is a collaboratory, you're out for problem solving. What you need to solve is better governance. You'll, you'll have your shot at it very, very soon, I promise you. We're not gonna uh, continue with the septuagenarian and octogenarian presidents all the time. It's time for young people to take the lead you understand the issues and to get on with it, but we want to help you to do this effectively. What does it mean to actually solve these problems? Well, first, you need to understand, of course, the scientific basis of the problem. And we would never understand the scientific basis of the problems of the Amazon were it not for great scientists like Carlos Nobre, who studied the Amazon and realized that the water cycle for example, was a critical part of how the Amazon works as a rainforest. And if you degrade some part of the rainforest, you could destroy the whole rainforest by destroying the hydrologic cycle. It's a, he came up with the idea of uh, rivers in the air as the forest recycles the water geographically and in fact is crucial for all of Brazil and for much of South America. And if you degrade the Amazon enough, you can reach a tipping point and lose much or all of the rest of the Amazon, turning it from a great rainforest into grasslands, turning it from a carbon sink, which is absorbing greenhouse gas carbon dioxide into a carbon source, which is greatly aggravating global climate change. So first you need to understand the science. Then you need to understand what can we do about it? What kinds of policies can stop the degradation? Could the forest be used in a sustainable manner? It could be left alone, that's one kind of answer, or perhaps it's used sustainably because there are millions and millions of people living in the Amazon. What should they do? What kind of livelihoods? Many are in cities. What about uh, those in cities? What about those in uh, villages? Of course, this is also a region of astounding human diversity. Uh, many tribes and languages and uh, indigenous populations and colonizing populations. How to have a peaceful, sustainable settlement and keep the Amazon protected. And that requires in brainstorming and in problem solving, new kinds of policies, 
new kinds of monitoring, uh, new kinds of incentive structures, new uh, uh, regulatory frameworks that make sense regarding the science. So our science-based regulations, not just something that comes out of a political compromise. And then once you have the idea of what should be done, how to put that into practice. Should we have a special fund to provide funding for communities that protect the Amazon? Should we have a payment for ecosystem services, which is one popular idea that seems to work at some scale, but it's never been implemented at a proper scale? Could there be kinds of industries that use the forest products in a profitable, and yet also sustainable way. How do we draw the boundaries of what should be done? How can we use remote sensing or satellite observations, which can tell us day by day, remarkably, what's being cut down where? So what kind of policy framework? I'm an economist. I tend to come into this story towards the end of the story, which is that I depend on scientists like uh, Carlos Nobre to say, here's really what should be done. And then as an economist, I like to ask the question, well, how can we finance what needs to be done? So I'm spending a lot of time these days on trying to mobilize financing for sustainable development. We spend a lot of money, as you know, on war, perhaps $2 trillion a year worldwide, but what do we spend on sustainable development, a tiny fraction of that? And I think it's absurd and dangerous that we couldn't even mobilize, as the rich countries promised, $100 billion annually to help the developing countries face the climate crisis. I can tell you how tiny $100 billion is one, you know, it took Elon Musk apparently five minutes to think that he would make a bid for a 44 billion for, for Twitter. That wasn't uh, a, a huge sum for one person, but 100 billion for the whole world. You know, the world economy right now is about $110 trillion of output per year. So, one trillion, roughly speaking, is 1% of world output and 100 billion is one tenth of 1% of world output. And yet the rich countries didn't care enough to fulfill their longstanding promise to mobilize 100 billion. Well, this is just to say, potentially we can afford to do a lot. As an economist, I tend to uh, look at these numbers of what's needed relative to measures like the scale of the world economy or the scale of the US economy or the scale of Elon Musk's bank account uh, and say, this is the kind of spending we should do. This is how it can be harnessed. And uh, I'm in the middle uh, today of writing up a, uh, a draft for a working group that, uh, that uh, Emma Torres and I are engaged in for the UN to come up with a set of proposals. But the best way for us to address this problem is to start at the beginning with the science, then analyze based on the science what can be done, then analyze the kinds of policies needed to put those measures in place, then to figure out, okay, how can we get that paid for? Is that private capital, public capital, some blended mix of the two? what kinds of institutions, banks, World Bank, and so forth can provide that kind of financing. So this is uh, to the collaboratory students, what I would urge you to do is uh, understand that these are very complex problems. They require actually years and years of study to fully master, but you're, the, you're in the process of that now. So start making solutions, they'll get better over time but especially study the underlying science, think about the public policy, think about the future we want, and think 
Well, in the economic sphere, how to mobilize the resources, usually a pretty small share of our total resources, as I've indicated, to help direct them towards the future we want. I'll say one final word before turning it back to you, Tom, which is that this class of problems, how to create a sustainable world, involves many different fascinating topics. That's why at Columbia, we've created a major in sustainable development and many master's degrees and a PhD in sustainable development to help you learn to think holistically and systematically and systemically to look at the interactions of a lot of moving parts on complex challenges. The Amazon is one, it's a vital one. A couple of days ago, I was at a meeting at the Vatican with oceanographers talking about the fact that our ocean is at tip, critical tipping points as well because of acidification, because of warming, because of changes or even stoppage of the so-called thermohaline circulation, the big ocean circulation that uh, one of the great Columbia University professors, the late uh, Wally Broker, uh, discovered and explained to the world. And we're grappling with the threats to that now. So there are so many things to work on. They are interconnected. And the collaboratory is a great, great way to get started on this adventure. But since you're going to be in charge very soon, work hard and find those solutions. Thank you very much. Back to you, Tom. And I'm afraid I'm going to have to uh, uh, leave now because I'm about to give a speech uh, down the hall. Very good, Jeff. And, uh, and wonderfully uh, inspiring words, a, a perfect start to the to the work of the collaboratory. Thank you for being with us today, Jeff Sachs. And uh, we look forward to checking in with you as the, as the course proceeds. And the... bye now. Well, <laughs> thank you for that, uh, Jeff. And welcome again. Now that I pause to take my breath, like, to draw a, a breath of air, uh, I'm now going to proceed with the, our very distinguished panel, uh, which we have alluded to already, that joins us here this morning. This is the first of four, I would call them classes for the collaboratory students that take apart uh, and digest and present to us in, in, um, in a ways we can more readily understand the conclusions of a 1400 page report uh, uh, on the, the Amazon we want. So this is something, 1400 pages, something easy to ignore or put aside or wait for a better time to read it, but you really won't do that uh, unless you have sort of people to help you and incentives to, to work your way through the, the main findings, to find out what the science is, uh, to find out what the uh, human impact is uh, of what's going on in the Amazon. And then to come up with Jeff, uh, Jeff's are inspiring words at the end, you know, you're going to be in charge, you students are going to be in charge, and many of the listeners who are listening in uh, today, you're going to be soon in charge you're gonna to have to do something about these problems. So that's sort of the spirit behind the collaboratory, behind the, the great uh, um, science panel for the Amazon report, the Amazon we want. Now, now so I put pressure on three great panels. I'm going to introduce them one at a time uh, and not in any great detail. You have their very impressive uh, biographies uh, already. Uh, I'm pleased to say this is, uh, I'm based here in. Rio de Janeiro in the, in the uh, Brazil office of Columbia University. Carlos, nobody who might introduce in a second is in, also in Brazil, but this is a, a regional issue. There's eight Amazonian countries and we have representatives well, as we go through the collaboratory today and as we go through the collaboratory from other countries that are involved uh, in, the, in the preservation of the standing, standing rainforest. So I'm, for, for their introductory remarks, uh, which uh, Hope will be something like 10 minutes each, so we'll have time for questions at the end. I'd like to start uh, with uh, Dr. Carlos Nobody. Uh, Carlos uh, of the University of Sao Paulo, uh, there's lots of ways to describe him if you just glance quickly at his CV, but I would say in common terms, he's the Brazil's foremost scientific authority on the Amazon. Jeff has already told you that. He's a, a, an earth system scientist. He's a co-chair of the science panel for the Amazon. He's a member of the Royal Society, the, United, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, and the Brazilian Academy of Sciences, and the World Academy of Sciences. So Jeff said, start with the science, Carlos, uh, and uh, 
we're very privileged to be that uh, we're starting with the science. We're able to start with you. So I'd like to welcome you to the collaboratory and invite you to prov uh, provide your opening remarks. Uh, good morning, Carlos. Good morning, uh, Thomas. Uh, good morning to everyone, to Jeffrey, Emma, Andrea, and all of you, and also to the students. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be talking to you about the Amazon we want. Of course, as you mentioned, there is this uh, almost confirmed uh, that uh, Dom Phillips and Bruno Pereira have been killed, assassinated in, in, the, in the Brazilian Amazon. This is really a very sad day. This is certainly not the Amazon we want. But let's hope uh, we will be able to find and to put forth the Amazon we want. And the science panel for the Amazon is really one initial attempt to bring science to bear for constructing a sustainable future for the Amazon. So I will try to share my screen. If you give me one second. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. OK. So, uh, so I will uh, basically uh, very briefly to, to say about uh, a few results about the Amazon and uh, Andre and Kalad and Emma Torres will give you further information. We established that in 2019 at uh, uh, New York U UN uh, in a meeting there. Uh, before the pandemic, so it was a presidential meeting. We put together 240 scientists, 42 uh, women scientists, 65% from Amazonian countries, seven indigenous uh, scientists as authors, we, a science steering committee, and also a strategic committee uh, with many respected leaders of and for the region. And the, then we released the report during COP26. Uh, uh, the the main goals basically is a rigorous scientific assessment of the state of the Amazon's ecosystem and its people. We look at also the trends and implications for the long term well being of the region, particularly the risk of the tipping point that Jeffrey mentioned. And also, we, unlike, uh, let's say, IPCC or IPES reports where they cannot be policy prescriptive, we are uh, really brave, courageous, and we put together many chapters which are really looking for a sustainable, a sustainable future, uh, sustainable development for the Amazon. And uh, uh, so basically the four key conclusions, I start with those conclusions, uh, a moratorium on deforestation for degradation of wildfires in Southern Amazon, because that's the region very close to the tipping point, I, I will show. Zero deforestation, degradation, wildfires in the whole Amazon by 2030, the COP26, 130 countries signed that uh, uh, the, the promise of zero, zero deforestation, all global forests, including tropical forests, uh, all Amazonian countries except Venezuela signed that, but still it's a big challenge. Of course, in the solution space, regeneration, reforestation, ecological restoration of the forest and degraded land, this is mandatory and very important. And of course, also on the solution space, the creation of a new bioeconomy of health, standing forests and flowing rivers based on science, technological innovation, indigenous peoples and local communities knowledge. So those were four key messages that the report put forth. Uh, let me just start by saying, the evolution of the Amazon rainforest is very unique, similar to other tropical rainforests, but unique also in the sense that the this recycling of water is really very efficient. The deep roots, uh, rain during the dry season as well, very short dry season, uh, not very hot temperatures at 30 degrees at uh, canopy temperature very efficient recycling of water. That's what I say, it's about 50% of the rainfall comes from water recycle. Uh, 
throughout the basin. And also, as Jeffrey mentioned, uh, you can see here the, the water vapor really recycles many times and gets out of the basin, coming to the southern South America, uh, also helps producing rain in many other areas. So this is unique uh, uh, in evolution over millions and millions of years. And also another aspect I want to highlight is that uh, it's very wet and, and the, the, the forests and ecosystems and the, its immense biodiversity evolved without fires, very rare fires during once a hundred years, perhaps a very severe drought would induce fires, but then the forest will, uh, will restore. Uh, and uh, so that's another aspect very important for the forest. But of course, we are very close to the tipping point. We have 17, 18% of the forest has been clear cut and 17% in several stages of degradation, particularly the southern portion here. You can see here on the map of rainfall, this is less than two meters of, of rain a year. This is very close to a different climate. Uh, we have had the lengthening of the dry season, this huge area here, 2.3 million square kilometers by five weeks from 1979 to the present. Uh, and also the, it's warmer, 1.2, 1.5 degrees warmer. So it's losing resilience uh, to climate change, local and also uh, global climate change. The forest is really weakening its strength as a carbon sink. Uh, it's, it, 1980s was removing 2 billion tons of carbon dioxide a year from the atmosphere. Now it's almost neutral, the whole forest. The land use, the areas deforest, recycle much less area. The grass in pasture land recycle much less. And uh, also we are seeing a much higher frequency of drops, 2005, 2010, 2015, 16, 2020. This is due to global uh, warming, the climate change, but also due to the local deforestation degradation. Uh, so basically, we are very close to this tipping point in which we may switch from this uh, forest to mostly open canopy degraded ecosystems, 60-70% of the Amazon, if we exceed 25% of deforestation or global warming of 2.5 degrees. We are very close. So no single or simple, no single simple solution. We really have to look for uh, global actions and local actions, uh, really having an agreement, having a success in achieving the Paris uh, Agreement, not letting the temp global temperature to exceed 1.5 degrees, but also to get zero deforestation, zero forest degradation, and also constructing uh, this new economy and the regional society empowered to conduct this uh, very disruptive transformation but needed. Uh, as I said, we are resisting. This is very important. We have to stop deforestation, degradation, wildfires, uh, also preventing degradation of aquatic systems. And Ryan Kalada will cover this in more detail in a few minutes. So one of the things is, of course, successful conservation restoration really to develop agroecological systems to restore many areas. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the potential, economic potential of these agroecological systems. Uh, so this is a big challenge. Uh, we have, as I said, 18% clear cut, 17% in several stages of degradation. And the fires, unfortunately, wildfires are becoming very common in the Amazon, more and more common due to climate change, severe droughts, but also to degradation of the forest. Also, uh, we have more than 700,000 square kilometers in the whole Amazon in cattle ranches, so, uh, and also on other uh, agricultural crops like soy. So we need also to improve tremendously the productivity and also to zero deforestation because we really do not need any further deforestation. 
uh, I just say here what would be a very important uh, project, a global project that would cost perhaps 30, 40 billion dollars, but very necessary. As Jeffrey mentioned, this is really nothing compared to the amount of spending that the world has in many areas like, like military spending. But this area is the, the uh, deforestation belt, mostly from the Atlantic all the way to close to the Andes. And that basically we need really to have a very massive forest restoration, regeneration, and the reforestation in this huge area, perhaps restoration of 1 million square kilometers of deforested and degraded forest that would remove uh, more than, than 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere contributing tremendously to, uh, to really fighting climate change and emergency and also preserving biodiversity and uh, perhaps saving this area of the Amazon from this tipping point. And also uh, this new bioeconomy, social, bi based on social biodiversity. The examples we have in the Amazon, all of the Amazon, we have perhaps more than 50 agroecological systems with cooperatives, and they are improving tremendously the life uh, of those populations. So this is really the way to go. Tremendous potential is really this new bioeconomy, healthy standing forest and, and flowing rivers. And uh, uh, of course, we are making this challenge. We, this is a scientific challenge, but also uh, is a challenge of merging science, technological innovations, and the knowledge of indigenous peoples and the local communities. So this is a big unprecedented challenge. There is no tropical country which has developed this new bioeconomy. We have to do it for the Amazon. So I will finish by just saying again, let's work together and particularly you yourself, students, young students, please put that as a challenge in your life, in your professional life. Uh, let's save the Amazon. Let's save the Amazonian population. This is really the Amazon we want. Thank you very much. Gracias. Obrigado. Obrigado, você, Carlos. And those are uh, truly striking, uh, striking remarks and an excellent way to begin uh, our assessment of the issues here. Maybe in the Q&A, we'll come back to some issues of the bioeconomy and the fact that in your own country of Brazil, but maybe in other countries as well that uh, 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 comprise parts of the Amazon basin, there's been 50, 70 years of economic development, which has been completely the contrary uh, of a bioeconomy. So you have what you might call a certain path dependence. We are where we are now. How, go, how do we go from where we are now uh, uh, with 35 million people depending on a somewhat destructive uh, non-bioeconomy to a bioeconomy, I think is a is going to be a major challenge uh, and one that's easily resisted for nationalist reasons in 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 this um, uh, in the re this region of the world uh, in near the Amazon basin. So thank you very very much, Carlos and uh, Andrea. You've already been partially introduced. We're all anticipating your remarks, but let me uh, briefly and not formally uh, uh, talk a little bit about you, Andrea Incalades, the vice rector. Uh, of the San Francisco de Quito University in, in Quito, Ecuador. Uh, obviously, she's a director there uh, in, uh, of a laboratory of aquatic ecology. So um, uh, Andrea is going to bring us expertise in river systems and uh, hydrology uh, of, of the Amazon. So critical for us to understand in this first session. She's also um, uh, the co-director of the Biosfera Research uh, Institute and her her research is focused uh, very importantly on the ecology of tropical rivers, but it goes beyond that to consider the socioeconomic uh, impacts on local populations, which is such a critical part of the dilemma that we're dealing with in the Amazon and why it's so urgent that we save the Amazon. So Andrea, bienvenida, uh, uh, nice, uh, nice to have you join us uh, uh, for your opening remarks that the floor is yours, Andrea Ancalada. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, good morning, Carlos. Good morning, Emma, Shannon, and all the students that are here. It's, it's a privilege for me to be here with all of you. Um, 
as Carlos told you, uh, the science panel for the Amazon has been this great effort to put together and systematize this information from the Amazon. And I'm very happy to present you uh, some of the findings that uh, we've, we have in the, in mostly in the river systems, but also a, what was the, the whole uh, project. So I want also to give you a, a little bit of the feeling of um, people working together towards having this information and uh, presenting solutions. Um, I don't know if you're able to see my, yes. my presentation there. Yes, we, yes, I think we can see it. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, so as Carlos mentioned, uh, the science panel for the Amazon uh, was this great effort uh, with many scientists and people from the Amazon participating in giving uh, understanding the first part of the Amazon as a regional entity of the earth systems, but also looking at some of the problems that we have in the area and proposing some solutions for, for the future. And uh, something that for me was very special is that, uh, and, and that we emphasize in the report, is that even though we know that the Amazon is this incredible rainforest, is way more than that. Uh, as Thomas mentioned before, and also Jeffrey Sachs, we are eight different countries living in the Amazon. And there are all these different environments from the highlands to the lowlands. So uh, this presents this incredible diversity of environments. So the Amazon is not heterogeneous at all, is, uh, is not homogeneous at all, it's very heterogeneous. So this picture here, even though you think, oh, these are mountains, right? This is also part of the Amazon. So the Andean mountain range uh, is this incredible uh, a mountain range that uh, drain a lot of the things that happens in the mountain go to the Amazon. So from the, from the here, from the Andes, we have more, than 6,000 kilometers to the way to lower down to the Amazon, to the Atlantic. So this is incredible because this presents all this uh, incredible diversity of light of, and ecosystems and people living here. And uh, so, so something critical also that we emphasize in the report is that based on the geology, and uh, we, we could understand also the evolution of life that we have in, in, in the whole Amazon area. Also based on this, we can understand how the biosphere and atmosphere change, uh, not just the region, but also the, the, the global climate. And also how these have affected the biodiversity and the ecosystem functions that the Amazon is, is doing for the whole world and for the region. And, and of course, how the people are living in, in the area and has been living for thousands of years. Uh, so we recognize that there is an evolution of more than 3 billion years of history here, right? So it's not something that happened recently. It has been a whole history of evolution. So the geology changed a lot. So you could see here, right, that the, Am the, the Andes range doesn't uh, arise all at the same time. It was a gradual process. And this gradual process of ra raising of the Andes change the whole system in the Amazon and the diversity and the evolution of life. And that's why we have a, an incredible diversity of life in the Amazon. So it just in a uh, hundred meters squares in the Amazon, we have all this diversity of life. Look at how many plants we have there. Uh, it's all uh, the diversity that, that we have there is almost compared to all the diversity that we have in, in, in Europe. And something that is incredible is that there's still so much diversity to, to get known because there is a, so much to discover that we still don't know. Um, and Carlos put this, this graph, and this is a very important graph because it, the, the Andes, not just uh, that, that is in, in this area, the Andes, also help to maintain a lot of the moisture that was coming from the forest. And this is critical for the, for, the, for the precipitation in the whole region, not, not just in the Amazon. We are seeing that up to 50% of precipitation in the Amazon is coming from the same forest. And this is critical for the river systems. And in, in these graphs, you could see here that, you know, we have different patterns of rain in the Amazon. So in some regions, 
like this part here in the south, we have a lot of seasonality. So we have a heavy rainy season and it, in a dry season. But here in, the, in, in, this, in this area here, in the, in the northwest um, of the Amazon, we, we see the, the opposite. So we see that there is no seasonality. We have rain all the time. And this, of course, impacts the river systems that we have in the area. Here you have a map of the different sub-basins that we have in the Amazon. And there are these uh, sub-basins that are enter this main Amazon uh, river. And, and each one of them are very different in terms of where they come from. Some come from the Guyana Shield, other from the Brazilian Shield, but others come from the Amazon. So the type of ecosystems, freshwater ecosystems that you have in the area are very different. So for example, you have black waters here. This is the Rio Negro. So all this area, you have a very special diversity and very special signature of the river system. Here you have clear waters. Here is very, very clear water. The diversity here is incredible. There is almost no erosion because these uh, mountains here are very old. And here you have white waters. This is very new because the Andes are new. So a lot of erosion come in this river system. So they are very dark. So here the, the diversity of fauna you, you have here have to be evolved in a dark environment with a lot of water that looks like chocolate. So this is very important because these, all these systems are connected, interconnected. So this is a huge network that are born up here, but they are draining to the main stem here in, in the Amazon that is gonna eventually go to the, to the Atlantic. So there's a lot of connections of the terrestrial environment and the aquatic environment. And this is critical for the productivity uh, of the system. So we have more productive systems in the, in the lower end here in the, in the rainforest because of this water that is coming from the highlands. So, all these pictures that I'm gonna show you here are part of the Amazon. So this beautiful mountain here is part of the Amazon already. So here's the continental divide. So all the rain that comes here is gonna drain through these small streams at the beginning, then go through the Cordillera, then they go to the Piedmont and they're gonna end up in these uh, lowland systems that are inundated. So this is already the tropical rainforest and this is how the Amazon looks like. So all this diversity that you have seen is incredible. And this is the diversity of ecosystems that end up being this diversity of flora and fauna. Just to talk uh, about fishes, there is more than 3000 uh, fishes in the Amazon. And scientists think that there are like 1000 species that haven't been discovered. Okay, so, and this is to talk about a vertebrate that is a big group, right? Let's talk about insects. Let's talk about uh, microbes. The diversity is, is incredible and there is so much to discover. And the important thing is that this water and the resources that are in these rivers are used by people from the highlands and from the lowlands. There are many people that are using this water. In fact, Quito City is an example of water that is moving from the Amazon to the capital city in Ecuador, and we're using this Amazonian water in, in Quito. So we are moving the water because it's so important. And we have many water in the Amazon that it goes to the highland cities in the Andes. And there's a lot of economic activities. So for example, all these boats that you see here in Peru, this is a picture in Peru, are uh, people that are do fishing. And the markets there are incredible. So fishing, freshwater fishing, in the Amazon is a very important economic activity. Do we know about it? We know very little, but we move everything by boats to these big markets in Manaus, in, in Iquitos, in Leticia. So um, Amazon fisheries are incredibly important. However, there are many problems in the Amazon as Carlos and Jeffrey were saying before. Uh, uh, and here in, in the report, we uh, try to summarize and not only summarize, but also emphasize where are the, the main problems that we have in the Amazon. So this, in this map here, you, you see some of the main problems put together, but something that we care a lot about and that Carlos already talked is the deforestation and degradation that we have, especially here in the South. Uh, but also we have a lot of mining and many of this mining is illegal mining. 
And this is a heavy and uh, important problem in this south part of Brazil as well, and here in the Guyanas, and a little bit in Ecuador and, and Peru and Bolivia as well. Uh, oil and gas uh, production is also a big problem, and especially with the oil spills that we have in the region, this sadly is a big problem in Ecuador, in my country. So there is a lot of uh, rivers that have problems with, with oil spills. And also a, a big concern is the construction of dams that we have in the Amazon. You could see here in pink, the ones that already exist, but in yellow, you see the ones that are planned. And some of the questions that we have in the panel is that, could we do better the planning on how we construct dams? And uh, in, a, a, in a recent paper of Almeida, he's a Brazilian scientist. Uh, you could see here the existing dams in the world and the, the proposed dams in the world. And something very striking is that we have a lot of proposed dams here in the Amazon region, also in the Congo, and also here in, in Asia and, and Indonesia. So the, the developing world is, is, uh, is planning to do more because we need right, the energy, but is this an, an, an a smart idea and could we build in a better way to have less impact on the ecosystems? And also, ba uh, based on the, our results, and this is from the panel, climate change is here, is now with us and is impacting the Amazon as Carlos just told you. So how is this gonna impact also the dams that we have in, in the Amazon? So in terms of the solutions, as Carlos mentioned, there's no single or simple solution. Uh, we need to have a broad set of initiatives uh, and they need to be adopted, replicated, adjusted and a scale up for systems that are bigger like the Amazon. So we need the participation of Amazonian people in planning and policy maker and, and, and policy maker processes in key, are key for these uh, initiatives. And um, we, uh, we wanna focus on, on four different um, uh, approaches. Amazon peoples, the rights, knowledge, and the well-being on the people that live there, also conservation and restoration initiatives, governance and finance, as, as uh, Jeffrey Sachs mentioned, finance is very important. Where do we put this money to help uh, people in, in different initiatives and in bioeconomy of healthy forests and, and rivers flowing? And uh, so, uh, Carlos already mentioned about the stop deforestation. This is critical, and this is also affecting the river systems. That deforestation um, is is also impacting what is being carried to the river system and how is impacting the livelihoods of people that depend on these river systems. And something that we learn already, based on the studies, is that protected lands and indigenous territories are protecting. Uh, really the land and we are conserving a lot of species and ecosystem functions there. And here we see an important opportunity in the river systems and we are proposing to have these tran transnational fluvial reserves. And, and an example of that is the Rio Putumayo and that already has a, a, an important project there, uh, there of the Amazon Sustainable Landscapes that is financed by the World Bank. And in this one, they are protecting this river system that doesn't have any dams and uh, is uh, surrounded by indigenous territories. There are other initiatives of these fluvial reserves, like here in the Napo, the Curaray River is a binational river, is Ecuadorian and Peruvian. And we are also proposed to do a fluvial reserve in here. And also there are many projects that are working with citizen science with, in these fluvial reserves uh, to help understand the diversity and the uses of the fisheries of the people in the region. Uh, another important recommendation is to uh, invest in science, technology, and innovation. These are keys. And this is an example of some innovations. This vessel that you see here collects uh, plastic garbage that come in the rivers and go to the ocean. So this is an example of how we could have innovation in things that uh, need to be resolved in our territories. Uh, another example is this uh, recent science papers of using artificial intelligence to actually um, uh, do these projects to plan better where we construct the dams. So we use computational sustainability that instead of using this for, for example, for our cell phone or other things, we're using computational uh, tools like artificial intelligence to resolve problems that we have. 
this, uh, I advise you to read this paper, it's a very nice paper in which we are, um, we are proposing to talk uh, and, and do a better um, dam configurations to have a less impact on, on the ecosystems that we have if we talk, then that means that we need to talk within the country. We, we need to have this international cooperation among the countries to lead more efficient strategic hydro planning uh, outcomes to have less impact on our ecosystems. So my final, um, my final uh, recommendation, and this is coming from the report, is that global action is needed. Uh, the success on the sustainability of the Amazon depends on all of us not just the people that live here, but people that live in all the world, because this is a global problem. So we need to address climate change and we need to improve our governance in many things. But for example, in supply chains to avoid exporting degradation, deforestation, overfishing and env environmental harm to, to other places. So my, my, uh, my call for all of you is that every single one of you have an important mission to understand better how these main and major ecosystems work in the world. The Amazon is one of these major ecosystems that is not only having an impact locally or regionally, it's having an impact globally, and it depends on all of us to, to help the Amazon uh, find a sustainable uh, a future. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea. That was a tour de force. Uh, and a very interesting one at that, which I think brings home a lot of messages that this is an issue for the whole world. It's our, our consumption of hamburgers, right? But to be very colloquial about it, that's driving deforestation or for mineral products. It's the demand of developed cities in, in Latin America, Sao Paulo, Rio, other big cities for hydropower that, that drives uh, the destruction uh, of the Amazon. And these are very powerful forces that uh, obviously uh, invest in interest that will fight back if we try to make the changes that uh, that you and Carlos and Jeff have told us about so far. But I want to thank you, Andrea, for the, the <laughs> making a quite complex scientific topic seem quite uh, uh, readily, the key points readily available to, to lay persons. Thank you for that. And thank you for pointing out how much of an issue this is regionally. It's not just the Brazil issue, which we tend to think of, but there are eight countries involved. How well do those countries collaborate? And, uh, so I, I, I appreciate all of those messages and we'll look forward to getting into more detail, uh, hopefully in the uh, time we'll have uh, for Q&A. But before we get to the Q&A, it's a great pleasure indeed to uh, uh, reintroduce a, a person whom I've called the, the instigator of all of this. Uh, Emma Torres uh, is uh, uh, the uh, SDSN's, the, Social, the Sustainable Develop Development Solutions Network Vice President for America. She's the uh, modestly named strategic coordinator for this uh, science panel for the Amazon, which means she made sure everything, uh, all the moving parts came together to produce this dramatic report, uh, which we are hopefully giving um, more visibility to this morning and through your work. So Emma, um, uh, I, I, you've worked a lot on the Amazon, not just on this report, but in other work that you've done with the United Nations and uh, you, you've got a vast experience yourself and you kind of have the vision du conjunto, you have the overview uh, of uh, what the importance of the science panel, the Amazon is. I'd like to turn to you for wrap up remarks to our panel, uh, on our panel and any, you know, round out the messages that we have, uh, we've heard so far. Emma, welcome to the, uh, to the panel. Oh, I think you got to unmute though first, uh, Emma. I always do that. Sorry, apologies. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. And thank you especially to all the students for their interest in the Amazon. I think it's a great opportunity to, to share with you. Uh, I think you had already fantastic presentations from Professor Sachs, Dr. Nobre, uh, Dr. Encalada, which have given you a little bit of a flavor of the complexity, but also the enormous uh, potential solutions that could emerge. Because I will, I agree with, of course, with all that they said, but I will highlight also that there are within these difficult moments, there are also some very positive things. First of all, the Amazon has the largest protected areas in the world. It's so therefore 
the mission is to conserve those protected areas and make sure that they, they are conserved and they function. Number two, they has is the largest areas of uh, territories of indigenous peoples that the governments have recognized. And of course they are under threat, but again, of all the world is one of the uh, regions that has done tremendous efforts. So our governments, our citizens have done some positive things in the Amazon. And we need to remind that, that there is the potential to do. And I very much welcome, like Jeff said, it's gonna be your turn pretty soon to roll a build up on the good things that the region has done over many, many uh, decades. The region also witnessed a lot of reduction on deforestation. Carlos Nobre, Professor Nobre was at that time in the government when they reduced dramatically deforestation in Brazil, while at the same time increasing exports. So it is possible to do that. Uh, we have also major institutions that are doing research uh, like Embrapa that is doing research to produce in areas that are being degraded so they don't need to invade further on the forest. So there are a number of, I would say, positive things. Second positive things come also from the political front. And you know, our governments in not now, but in the past were enlightened enough to create the Amazon Treaty of Cooperation because they understood that there is a need to manage sustainably the Amazon collectively because it, as both uh, Professor Nobre and Andrea have showed to you, the systems are interconnected. So if you do one thing in one place good, doesn't mean that this will not happen uh, something bad in the other place. So we really need to see an interconnected system. Therefore, it has to be understood scientifically, all the interconnections, which are very complex, it has to be managed politically interconnected too. So therefore our governments had that vision of creating that Amazon Treaty of Cooperation. We are in touch with them. We are briefing them. We're gonna of course make available all the science uh, documents and materials that we have so they could inform policy, make it um, at, the, at the regional, at the national and local level. Uh, I would say that globally again, it's, it's you know, I had the privilege to work most of my career with the United Nations and I still work with them. And one of the things that, you know, we always thought that the Amazon could be, you know, is an amazing place, uh, has a lot of, uh, not only a tremendous biodiversity, tremendous contribution of water cycles and climate change, but also it is part of our culture. You know, there is a tremendous cultural knowledge. I mean, in the foreword of a report that we produced many years ago called Amazonia Without Meat, Garcia Marquez, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez wrote that forward and he said that the oldest ceramica in the continent was found in the Amazon, which means there were cultures in the Amazon for millennia. So I, we need to also conserve that and learn from them. And, I, I'm, and we are very fortunate that in our panel of the science panel of the Amazon, we had indigenous people scientists. And we, as we consolidate the panel, will expand even more. And this is an area that again, you can also explore because a key issue is how to, and that I think a lot of universities are thinking about it is this transversality of knowledges, how you integrate this knowledge in a systematic rigorous way. And I think um, I'm hopefully, and, and I know that panel is gonna contribute to that effort globally uh, as we move in the next phases. Um, I, uh, we are in the Sustainable Development Solution Network is a, is a, is a network that was created uh, up under the auspices of the Secretary General, who asked Professor Sachs to lead on that. We have over 1,600 universities in the network and it's still growing. And um, they are globally. Uh, and one of the things we are obviously uh, working very closely with all the universities is to contribute to policy making and informed policy make based on science, based on evidence, based, based on collaboration. And therefore the science panel of the Amazon is the product of that kind of thinking. And that's why Professor Sachs at the request of the scientists from the region convened this panel. Uh, we are in the process of uh, engaging with stakeholders of the financial private sector for, for the reasons that you already heard from the presentations, they are engaged in the Amazon, not always in a good way. So therefore we want to engage with them in a dialogue. We would like also to engage much more with, the, with our governments. So they invest in conservation, but also they invest in innovation in science and technology, because the way to preserve the forest down the line is gonna be with a lot of innovation. So we can keep the forest standing, 
and have you know the possibility is too much of a large uh, area of the continent so it has to be an engine of growth but it has to be an engine of sustainable growth sustainable and for that we need tremendous amount of in in investment in science technology and innovation so this is another item of our agenda as we engage and uh since you know we have such a magnificent um work of this amazing panel uh, we've been inspired by them and now we are going to be moving and creating something similar in the Congo. We're already beginning a dialogue on the Congo and eventually, like Professor Sachs alerted, in Indonesia. So the idea would be to really have a, a, the scientific panels, which are primarily by science for the, for the regions, uh, science that's from the region, but also that they could learn uh, between the three um, groups in terms of uh, possibilities to conserve uh, our fantastic tropical forest and also con contribute to um, reduce climate change and, in and enhance biodiversity to the benefit of all of us. And like we all said, and eventually to have the Amazon we want. Thank you, Tom. And I know you're running out of time, so I'm not gonna extend me myself more, but I'm open for questions. Thank you. Yeah, I know a lot more that we could learn from your Experience. We're excited to know that maybe the work being done in the Amazon is already setting a template for work that could be done in the Congo and other tropical rainforests around the world. And I guess a good message. Uh, and by the way, there are many, many other messages in this uh, in this fantastic report of the SPA. One of the messages I get from you, uh, Emma, is that the SPA will continue to exist in some form, and that possibly there's a role for universities around the world, including Columbia, but many others as well, to collaborate and to give more institutional footing and global reach uh, to the SPA uh, and to encourage them uh, in, in their efforts. Well, the, the next part of the agenda calls for me to summarize what we learned so far, and that's mission almost impossible. I think you'll understand, and then, then I'll turn to Q&A, but uh, some of the key points that I've extracted so far from the four wonderful panelists whom I thank again very much um, uh, about the volume is that the, the the tipping points, the concept of tipping points in the Southern Amazon, deforestation already at 18%, clear cut and, and uh, 25% being a, being a sort of tipping point. That existing patterns of development as Andrea reminded us and Carlos as well is hugely destructive. Oil and gas leases, my God, we had all these other threats and I've forgotten to mention oil and gas leases uh, throughout the um, a, a, a Amazon, an awful lot of, uh, uh, but there's some hopeful messages as well. The regeneration, reforestation, and ecological restor uh, uh, restoration is possible. Um, global climate change can be uh, uh, dramatically influenced positively by taking the touch of collective issues and collective stance and doing something about this involving all the governments of the world. Um, uh, another message is that to remember the people of the Amazon. Easier said than done, and throughout our history, we haven't done that. Uh, we still have uh, something like uh, a large thousands of tribes in the Amazon, many different language groups, people who have yet not had uh, contact outside. These people are a small part, small fraction of the pre-colonial population in the Amazon, but there are our colleagues in all of this and the, and the very best stewards of the Amazon, and certainly the knowledge that they have uh, is what we must tap into. And the final point I'll mention among many others, as I say, there are many messages that we've all heard this morning, uh, is the bioeconomy. Carlos mentioned this, Andrea referred to it, so did uh, Emma and Jeff. The bioeconomy is a solution space. You've got, you've got 35 million people living in the Amazon. They have to live from something uh, and it can't be a, an imposition coming from abroad uh, that uh, knocks out air industries that are providing livelihoods with nothing to take its place. So that's really the area that maybe many of you uh, students listening in, myself personally feel challenged to come up with, to think about the bioeconomy, the solution spaces, which is such an important part of this report. So that was my best attempt in a minute or two to wrap things up and give everyone a chance to uh, catch at their breast. I'm, I'm running a little bit uh, later than I hope to, but I'm gonna call upon my my good colleague, really our host uh, today, uh, Shannon Marcus. And Shannon, uh, I think you, uh, and every remark you have to make, and I think you're gonna introduce our first student questioner. Shannon. Yes, I believe we have a student who's coming on live to ask the question, correct? Yes, so, yes we do. Okay, I don't see the student added as a panelist yet. Okay, we're gonna, let's get a second. Him. 
as a there it is. There we it's, uh, it's really, really huge, yes. Wonderful. I see our student has been added. This is exciting. <clears throat> so it is my pleasure to introduce our student who will ask a question today, Billy Hughes. Billy is a first year Columbia University student studying German and linguistics. He's involved in several clubs on campus, including Students Exploring Whiteness, Alkita Club, Hall Council, and intramural basketball. He's also been a youth ambassador for the Congress Bundestag Youth Exchange. Through participation in the collaboratory, Billy hopes to gain a better understanding of the personal views of other participants and work together to think of solutions. Billy, welcome to the collaboratory. We'd love to hear your question. I think Billy got, there we are. Yeah, Hi, thank you so much. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yes, Billy, we can. Awesome, thank you guys so much for doing this. It's been really informative and inspiring. I, I found it so awesome to hear from all of you guys. Um, I have a particular question uh, for Emma, but also Dr. Encarada had, had mentioned this a little bit, um, working with native populations, indigenous populations to, uh, you know, learn from their knowledge and their historical presence in the Amazon. Have you, found a way to best navigate mistrust or tension that might exist between colonial governments and uh, native populations, or if, if that hasn't been really your goal, do you have recommendations for how government should, should proceed with that? Oh, I, I think you're muted, Mr. Trout. Yeah. Um, I, I would, I would, I would ask. Okay, that, go ahead, Emma. <laughs> yeah, can I speak that? Okay, good. Yeah, I yes, would ask. Andrea, I, I, I like, I like Andrea to elaborate, uh, but I would like to say a very, in very general terms that, as I said, the panel is a scientific panel, so it's not really engaged in the, in, in, in the, in the actions, actual action on the ground, but obviously we had indigenous people scientists and they know and they were, have work and there are a lot of other scientists that have worked also with indigenous people's communities. So we have, uh, we follow obviously a code of conduct that is a code of conduct of the UN. And also we have in the panel a code of conduct. So it's not that the work of the scientists is not perceived as a colonial or, or a, 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 a colonial approach or disrespectful approach to the communities. So. But again, this is a scientific panel. It doesn't really work on the ground. Uh, so in basically, particularly at the level of the assessment, it was get the information that exists already and put it together comprehensively. In the future, uh, we will engage probably much more in what I said, this transversality of knowledge. And a lot of groups are beginning to understand this. So the panel probably will contribute into better understanding and better trying to integrate and mobilize that knowledge. Uh, so that, that in a very sort of uh, simple way, I would like to answer your question. Your question was much more to the ground, but anyhow, Andrea is uh, working much more on the ground, so she maybe can contribute a little more. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Emma. Thank you, Billy, for, for your question. So uh, I think it's is, is very important that indigenous people are heard. So um, we have been working in, in the field a lot, and, uh, and uh, for me, it has been very interesting to see how they want to participate in science themselves. So all these projects that we have of citizen science have been very successful because they don't want to hear that the water is contaminated. They actually want to test if the water is contaminated by themselves. So I think that involving indigenous people in the, in the science, not just in governance, but in the science is very powerful. And, uh, and, and also I have noticed, for, for example, Tuntiak, uh, he's a Shuark um, member. Uh, he, he goes to the UN as well to tell about the, the, what, that, what they have done in the field. And he is talking with the president of Ecuador, for example, with the president of Colombia, with presidents of uh, the, the Amazon countries. And if they have the firsthand information because they measure that, um, they could communicate what are the problems on the ground. So I, I think that involving um, indigenous communities in science is very important and these at every level. So we could involve uh, kids, we could involve, um, uh, we could involve um, uh, young people, 
but also here in, in, the, in the university, for example, that the number of students of indigenous communities that are coming to study science uh, is, is increasing and increasing. So I think that uh, regarding to, to your questions, native populations are not, uh, not, not all of them are isolated anymore. So they want to be in contact, they have a voice, and, uh, and they are uh, talking more with the governments and that is, is critical for reaching an understanding and, uh, and looking together for a sustainable future. Uh, we are very proud with, with Carlos that we incorporated a lot of uh, um, uh, sign, scientists from indigenous communities that are uh, uh, right now studying their own land, uh, their own rivers, their own forests and their own people and they, and they are also part of our panel. So uh, I don't remember, uh, Carlos, maybe you know this number, how many sign, uh, indigenous scientists do we have in the panel? Uh, the, the number is pretty, is, uh, is pretty good. Uh, not as many as we would like, but there are more scientists that are participating uh, in, in the panel. Yes, uh, yes, we had uh, seven indigenous uh, scientists in the panel. Uh, and I just want to compliment that one big challenge, Billy, is that we, when, we, when we talk to in, indigenous people, they want, as Andrea said, they want to really to benefit also from modern science, but they want to merge modern science with their traditional knowledge. And, and so this is a big challenge, and I think we have to put forth this challenge for instance, in creation of uh, indigenous universities, we have very, very little, a little bit of that. So those are challenges that we have to face. But uh, for instance, many indigenous uh, groups now, they want also to incorporate modern technologies in processing the forest products they are doing. So this is something that we should proceed. Uh, and of course, the panel is a good way to develop, to help developing or, or to motivate in the scientific community the technological innovators in pursuing th those solutions that benefit directly the indigenous people. Thank you so much, uh, Carlos, Andrea, and Emma. And Billy, thank you for representing our student group so well uh, and getting the ball rolling. I have a, there are some questions in the Q&A and a number of others that the students have contributed. And maybe if we're lucky, we'll get in two questions before we have to wrap up at the bottom uh, of the hour today. Uh, but uh, Esther and Stefan uh, uh, in the Q&A uh, are, are among other students, uh, Carlos, in addressing a question that maybe you could set on first is, how do you scale up the, the bioeconomy? I, I'm, not, I'm not doing justice to the richness of the question, but it, it's one thing, there's not that much of a demand for those forest products. They're not gonna generate this sort of livelihood and technology that the region as itself needs to grow. It's this question, it's in a gigantic question, but. I guess it could be summarized as how do you scale up the economy, the bioeconomy we want uh, in, in the Amazon is, how do you prevent that from being seen as sort of uh, a, a, an idealistic vision, which isn't going to happen. The reality of the world is oil and gas leases and hydro dams and, and uh, in industry, uh, the, the bioeconomy, the vision of the bioeconomy is gonna have a hard time competing with that. Carlos, could I ask you to comment on that? Uh, yes, a, sh a short comment. Yes, that's a big question. And but however, I think we have to be optimistic about that because and of course we need this is a global effort. It's not only an effort of the Amazonian populations, the indigenous people, the local communities, even the urban uh, communities in the Amazon to develop this new bioeconomy uh, with hundreds of different forest products, aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems, but also the world has to be open to this new bioeconomy. Yes. For instance, we have a very good example of acai berry. Acai berry today exists all over the world. It's a $15 billion industry. $1.2 billion comes back to the Amazon. It has improved the livelihoods of those people. So this is one example. Brazil, Brazil nuts is another example. So, but however, the potential is not only two, three, four products. We have a, a tremendous potential. So the world also has to favor this biodiversity and that would really make this bioeconomy to scale up. And uh, because uh, let's say one hectare of agroecological system in the Amazon 
uh, has a, a profit between $500 and $1,000 a year. Cattle ranch, $100. Soy crops, $200. So the economic potential is tremendous. But of course, scaling it up depends on creating the market. So this is a cha global challenge, but of course, also the, the world of investment. The investors should also support this transition. If there is plenty of investments in these agroecological systems, I'm very optimistic we are going to scale up this bioeconomy. Thank you, Carlos. Very, very good words indeed. I'm trying to um, summarize a, a question. I, uh, I've got one that has been submitted by three students. Uh, maybe I'll put this one to you, Andrea, or to you, Emma. Um, uh, Tainata, Pablo, and Guilherme are asking, to what extent is the international community, not just the Amazon region countries, not just our eight countries, responsible for destruction? And what measures do you believe should be taken by national states, international organizations to address the issue? What are the realistic pathways to international cooperation, especially from the rich countries uh, who have profited from extractivism? Tough question. It's been addressed, I know, and talked about, but I wonder if you could take that one head on. How do you get, how do you get the countries with the resources to, to get off uh, 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 in, in, a pattern of inaction and to actually do something? Jeff, Jeff struck a somewhat pessimistic note about that. What do you think? <clears throat> Yeah, it's a very important question and is, is um, you know, and that's why it's so important that the whole globe knows about this because the demand of many resources come from abroad, not from the within Amazonian countries. So for example, meat. Meat, the Brazil is selling most of the meat to Europe, right? Yeah. So that means that there's a demand from Europe from this meat and that, that is why is, this is working. And we are converting all these tropical rainforests into this pasture for, for cows, right? So that yes. means that if people knew that, they will say like, no, I don't want to eat that meat anymore. We, we could eat yeah. local meat and we could eat less meat, for example, yeah. right? So there are right. all th these things that we could think locally, right? And it could impact globally and regionally. So there are many things like that. So for example, the ideas of building dams uh, where, where this is coming from, right? And most of the money in, uh, for building the dams are not coming from our countries, are coming from abroad. And they are sell us good ideas. But are there other good ideas that we can implement on site that are less destructive, for example, right? So th there are many things that the necessities are in other places that are not in the Amazon countries, right? And, and, and that's why we need people to understand how the demands that we have every day could impact other places. And this is related with everything, with, with what we use, our cell phones, right? Uh, we all use cell phones and, and uh, we need a, a lot of, um, a, a, a lot of uh, how do you say, copper, a lot of gold, a lot of different materials are, are used for this. How much do we change our cell phones? And uh, so are we thinking responsible as uh, citizens of the world? Because what we're using are impacting the natural resources uh, of different regions. And of course, you know, the Amazon, because it's so big, you know, eight different countries, necessities around the world are uh, being demanded uh, for local resources here, for regional resources here. So, so that's my part. I, I know that Carlos also want to add more information on, on that. Okay. I don't know if Carlos wants to weigh in on that point, or if he'll allow me to sneak in a different question, Andrea, for Carlos, and that'll be our final yeah, question. That's fine. And I'll hand it over to Shannon after I do. Carlos, uh, Maria Artiaga is asking something that you mentioned at the outset, and this is the the insecurity uh, of those people, journalists and indigenists and scientists uh, who want to defend the environment. It's particularly an issue today. We mentioned Don Phillips and Bruno Pereira at the outset of, the, of our collaboratory this morning. But I guess, Carlos, what is it that, I guess there's two questions. What is it that, uh, that motivates brave people to do such dangerous things? And second is what, can, what should we, do, we be doing to protect them better 
as they do that. I, maybe that'll be the final question for, for you, Carlos, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Yes, uh, Thomas, unfortunately, we are seeing the Amazon in, in the last several years, but particularly in the last three and a half years, uh, we are seeing crime exploding, uh, exploding in the Amazon. The organized crime, narco traffic, land grabbing, illegal mining, illegal uh, agriculture, illegal fishing, all those things exploded in most of the Amazon, not to say all of the Amazon. And uh, of course, we need really governments, the Amazonian countries' governments, to be much more severe and uh, effective in combating organized crime. And, uh, uh, and also protecting the, the, the traditional populations and the, the uh, leaders, environmental leaders, and also journalists, as we unfortunately are seeing now, uh, because really this is a place where organized crime is finding a way to make a lot of money. Of course, narco-trafficking has been organized crime for, for many, many decades, but now it, it, it take, it's taking over all economic activities becoming illegal. So I, I don't really see ways to fight that if we are not going to get uh, the governments of our countries. And I would say in particular, Brazil, because the major problem that has explosion and the, the assassinations of leaders, indigenous leaders, um, uh, leaders of communities, uh, local communities, uh, is the fact that the Brazilian government now has, uh, the federal government has a political speech encouraging this exploitation of the Amazon with, with cattle ranches, with illegal mining. So that really gave a lot of room for the organized crime to, to even to move into the Amazon and to, to have full control. So we need to change these governments uh, but also we need really to make to 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 yeah, to make a loud uh, assessment and also to engage the the planet that we are seeing now the reaction that we are seeing internationally and in the Amazonian countries against the very likely assassination of these two leaders Bruno Pereira the indigenous leader and also indigenous and uh, the journalist John Phillips is something that will raise again the issue that we have, all of us have to fight all of the countries of the world against what's going on in the Amazon. Thank you very much, Carlos, for that wrap up. Laura, uh, Shen, I'll turn it back to you and not without first thanking Gail Lynch uh, of, uh, of your uh, unit at the University, Shen and Lauren Barreto uh, of the SDSN, working close with Emma Torres without the help of them and their teams. This. Uh, this uh, collaboratory couldn't have happened and reminding uh, reminding all of all participants that we will continue basically over the next three or four weeks uh, with the seminars to fully explore the panel's results. Panelists, thank you very much. Profoundly for me, Shannon, uh, back to you. Thank you, Shannon, for committing the structure we've all been operating in it today and the final remarks would be yours. Thank you. Sure, well, thank you. Well, we've had an engaging discussion on the Amazon we went. Our conversation touched on many critical issues related to the science and policy, economics, activism, as well as the impacts on indigenous communities. This was the first seminar in a series of seminars focused on the Amazon delivered as a part of the Global Columbia Collaboratory, our virtual exchange platform that's bringing Columbia students, thought leaders, and educators from around the globe together to reflect, ideate, and collaborate to make an impact. We are looking forward to the rest of this special series of collaboratory seminars focused on the Amazon, which will be offered this summer. So please keep an eye out for the announcements. Seminar number two, Thursday, June 23rd, the Amazon as a regional entity of Earth Systems. Seminar three, Monday, June 27th, land use, climate and demographic changes. And seminar four on Thursday, July 7th, the solution space finding sustainable pathways for the Amazon. Thanks again to our esteemed panelists who joined us today and to our amazing moderator. Many thanks to Columbia Global Centers, Columbia World Projects, Columbia College, and the Center for Undergraduate Global Engagement. And of course, we want to extend our very special thank you to our collaboratory students, 
partners and participants from around the world. A reminder that a link to a recording of the full webinar will be sent to everyone who is registered. And for others, you'll be able to find it on our websites. Thank you and be well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Bye.